Oh, we're going to get back to your host. Okay, it's, uh, it's one minute past four in the UK, Saturday the 5th of September 2020. Have a think about that one. Still feels like August to me for some reason. And uh, the only thing that I really want to do uh, in this show is, oh, the show's called Free Association, by the way. Uh, my name's Dennis. Uh, we're here every week on Saturday afternoons. It's 11 a.m. In, in the East Coast on the States, uh, but 4 o'clock here in the UK. Uh, I've been watching a, a short, short video about a movie called They Live, so I wanted to play that. And then uh, I'll talk a little bit about the movie and my kind of perception of the movie. Uh, let me see if I can pull that up. Of course, I had to restart my, my computer. So let me uh, share screen. Share sound. There we go. And then the, the technical YouTube stuff. All right, so They Live was a movie that came out in the 80s, and it's, a, it's an allegory, really. It's a, an allegory that revolves around sunglasses that show you the truth. Um, let me see how, how easy it is to get the video up that I was watching. There's a few different, I, I watched this a little while ago, a couple of months ago, now during lockdown, seemed appropriate somehow. Uh, and it's a good movie to watch with your friends on a Friday night. If you if you happen to be able to do that on a, on a reasonably large screen, let me find a six minute version that I was watching. Right, here's a one for you. Seven th things you probably didn't know about They Live. This isn't the video I was watching, but it's good enough. So I'll turn the volume up a little bit on here, and we should be good to go. This is on the Cinefix channel. Said, it's the 30th anniversary of the action sci-fi cult film They Live, and yeah, we just did Halloween, but can you blame us if Carpenter made another semi-holiday related film? It's election season, it's time to look at the film that warns us that while they live, we sleep. Here are seven things you didn't know about They Live. Probably. We all know you guys are here to talk about the fight scene, and we promise we'll get there. But first, you may know They Live is based off a short story, 8 o'clock in the morning, then later the comic Nada, both by Ray Nelson. What you may not know is the film star and professional wrestling legend Roddy Piper believed that the events of the film were based off a real event called the Bronswick Affair. He describes how in the 1950s the waves from a specific TV caused people to buy in excess, specifically recounting the story of a woman who bought multiple cans of dog food but had no dog. I don't want a dog. I don't even like dogs. In actuality, The Brunswick Affair was a mockumentary short that Piper must have seen and confused as a real event in the past. But, hey, he wasn't too far off. You look like your head fell on the cheese dip back in 1957. The first few times Nada puts on the sunglasses are just as jarring for the audience as it is for him. It quickly expresses the effect of subliminal messaging by showing the black and white truth in, well, black and white. Both the color and black and white billboards and wider landscape shots were actually matte paintings by Jim Danforth. But Nada's view of the grocery store set was so elaborate and detailed, with all the practical subliminal messages printed on cans and boxes, it became the most expensive cost of the production. But it was most likely worth it. The look of the film was nothing short of iconic. 
almost as iconic as this segue. Although Roddy Piper's character isn't named until the credits, Keith David's Frank shares his name with the screenwriter of the film, Frank Armitage. You may be familiar with some of Armitage's other work, such as Halloween, The Thing, Escape from New York. For those of you catching on to what I'm doing, that's right, John Carpenter wrote They Live under the alias of Frank Armitage, which is a reference to Dr. Henry Armitage, a character in H.P. Lovecraft's The Dunwich Horror. Both Armitages have to deal with a disguised threat rising to power, and David definitely holds his own against the evil aliens taking over our society. Carpenter wrote the part for David after working with him on The Thing, and after fighting that thing, he could definitely take on the vase. You have your authorization cards. Right here. Ah! The film's subliminal messages influenced street artist Shepard Ferry in the creation of his Obey clothing brand. It's a little ironic, though, that Ferry took the film's anti-capitalist message and kind of, sort of, used that to create a company for profit. But in addition to those awesome black and white billboards, you already know the aliens are a signature look as well. What you may not know is that in addition to coordinating the ridiculously awesome fight scene, again, more on that later, Jeff Imada played most of the featured ghouls you see on screen, men and women. The aliens in the short story have green reptilian flesh or multiple yellow eyes, which is a more traditional 50s sci-fi interpretation of aliens. But Carpenter wanted them to look like a corrupted human to emphasize humanity's corruption at the hands of consumerism. Or, at the very least, like the corruption caused by buying tons of dog food. I don't even like dogs. I have come here to chew bubblegum and kick ass. <laughs> And I'm all out of bubble. Probably the most memorable line from the movie was never in the script. Carpenter just wanted Nada to say something badass when he walks into the bank. And Piper kept a book of one-liners on hand for his work in the wrestling ring and shared it with Carpenter. They came across this one-liner and the rest is film history. I came here to drink milk and kick ass. And I've just finished my milk. <laughs> They Live is clearly a scathing commentary on Reaganism and consumerism in the 80s. I mean, hell, listen to the alien politician on the TV during the supermarket scene. The feeling is definitely there. It's a new morning in America. If that sounds familiar, it's because the phrase morning in America played a big part of Reagan's re-election campaign of 1984. It's morning again in America. So, take any other interpretation of this film, especially that insane anti-Semitic one, and shove it. Carpenter has repeatedly stated that he made this film as a direct reaction to yuppies and capitalism, and that he thinks you're dumb and wrong. No! All right, all right, now it's time to get to the fight. The thing you already know about the fight is that it's awesome. Period. Full stop. What you may not know is the fight was inspired by John Ford's The Quiet Man, starring John Wayne, which also features a comically long fight throughout the small town. Carpenter took advantage of having a professional wrestler in his film and wrote in a long fight scene. Piper and David worked with stunt coordinator Jeff Imada for weeks to get this fight scene right, with every suplex, punch, and groin kick. Also, and this is according to Piper, it once held the Guinness World Record for the longest fight in movie history. We can't officially verify that, but I wouldn't have argued with him while he was here. I'm not going to question him now that he's gone. <laughs> That's it for this episode, but let us know in the comments if you care about democracy. Thanks for watching, and subscribe to Cinefix for more truish things about movies, and sometimes being all out of bubblegum, right here on Things You Didn't Know. Right, so there you go. That's uh, some things you didn't know about They Live. They Live is a good movie. It's a good movie to watch with people who maybe aren't as awake as you are. Or, or if you want to have a conversation and it's a way to bring some things up. The, the aliens are from Andromeda, in case you didn't know that. Uh, that's revealed at the end of the movie um, when there's some kind of teleport thing on, on the end uh, and they're going to Andromeda the, the, the guy at the end of the movie who shows them around uh, explains all of this so the, the plot kind of wraps up with an explanation which I found interesting because it's like there was nowhere really to go with it uh, but 
killing a satellite dish on top of a TV studio is a, a good metaphor for switching off your TV. Uh, the fact that everything is, revolves around broadcast messages in this movie. Uh, the wake-up call is via TV as well, so it's not just about brainwashing and indoctrination and subliminal messages, it's it's about the wake-up call being there as well, and that's that's something that I'm interested in because where there's a problem, there's usually a, a solution to that problem. Usually, the two the two are in parallel. If you in nature, if you find a a poisonous plant, there's usually the antidote growing really close, or something that can be used as an antidote is close to the in proximity to the the poisonous plant. And that tends to be the way um, in mind as well. I mean, I'm very interested in, in how my mind works. I spend a lot of time sitting thinking about how my mind works. And it might not be particularly useful in terms of day-to-day -day life, but it, it helps me. And uh, it helps me to, to understand who I am. And once I know who I am, I'm, I'm able to act in the world in a way that's appropriate for me. Um, I don't do peer pressure. I never really have, uh, which isolated me when I was a kid because I didn't join in with the stuff that everybody else was doing. Uh, I still don't join in with the stuff that everybody else is doing, really. Uh, maybe a little bit more now that I'm an adult. Uh, but I'm still picking and choosing. I'm being selective about things that I engage in and things that I don't engage in. I was thinking this week uh, at work, I write, I write little pieces of, of topics and, and anecdotal information and, and lists at work that then kind of turn into bits and pieces for the radio show on Saturday. And I was thinking at work, I think on Tuesday or Wednesday, about philosophical narratives that uh, that I've lived in and that other people have lived in and they live is is one of the philosophical narratives that people live in it's a it's a hidden enemy it's a hidden disguised enemy uh, integrated with consumerism now John Carpenter said that this wasn't about any kind of Jewish conspiracy it was about Reaganism it was about Reaganomics in the 80s. So it was a political commentary on the political situation in America at the time. Uh, and I'm quite happy to stick with that interpretation. If that's what they were doing, then that's what they were doing. Uh, there's still plenty of subliminal messages floating around. You can, If you start looking for subliminal messages and simplifying what's going on, to the point where it's a one or two word kind of slogan or whatever, then you can you can disentangle subliminal messages fairly easily from from mainstream media. I don't watch a lot of TV and I don't watch a lot of movies anymore, but but I do occasionally, and I I do watch a little bit of Netflix here and there, uh, and I'm I'm quite liking at the moment. Uh, a show called The Order, which I watched the first one and a half episodes of. I didn't really watch the first one all the way through, but it's a show about uh, a college fraternity and a werewolf. And uh, it kind of ticks all the boxes of things that I like to watch because it's a bit, it's a bit hokum. Uh, it's got some truth to it because the uh, college fraternities at Yale or whatever uh, have some nefarious um, assumptions going on, um, uh, philosophical assumptions and and uh, whatever blood pacts with other members of of the fraternity or whatever it is that's going on in Skull and Bones. I really um, have to do a bit more research to be able to tell you exactly what's going on with Skull and Bones, but I know it exists, and I know that. Uh, George Herbert Walker Bush. 
Now, was it George W. or George H. W.? I think both of them were members of Skull and Bones, the presidents along the way, uh, and uh, senior members of presidential staff or whatever. So the, the way that things show up in, in popular culture is interesting. And then if there's truth in what they're doing, it becomes a philosophical narrative. So I'm kind of being a bit careful about which which narratives I drop into. I've already been in the in the David Icke um, reptilian shapeshifters kind of narrative for a little while over the years. So I don't really want to drop into they live. Uh, I'm a bit cautious about dropping into anything that involves um, a, any kind of um, interdimensional overlords. I'm just, a, it seems a bit like it might be uh, a bad place for me to be in terms of where it will take my head. So I need to be in the right head space to be able to go there. And I'm not at the moment, so I'm not going to go there unless I know that I'm in a good headspace and I can pull myself out of it again. Because uh, I don't want to take on the clothing of a of a they live narrative uh, without being able to take those clothes off and put put on a different set of clothes, philosophically speaking, using that as a kind of metaphor. Right, let's find another another they live video that's quite short i found there was one on here that was 20 minutes long but uh i don't think i'll do that one i might do a little bit of it and see how it pans out i'm already 10 minutes into it so let's just see this is the uh oliver harper channel it's a they live retrospective it's got some dialogue in it so it'll give you a bet better idea about the movie I believe was used in reference to the 1986 comic of the same name. Carpenter was a big fan of wrestling since he was a kid, and John met Roddy at WrestleMania 3 during the height of Roddy's popularity. They struck up a friendship and Carpenter thought he would be perfect for the role because he had the look of a working class man. The classic line used in the movie, I have come here to chew bubblegum and kick ass, was a line Roddy had come up with. He gave John a bunch of lines he used in his wrestling days and they both felt that this was the best to use for that scene. The legendary Keith David plays Frank. John was impressed by David's work on The Thing and specifically wrote the role of Frank for him. It's revealed Frank is from Detroit and his wife and kids are still there. It appears he has come out to LA to find work as the recession has dried up the jobs market. For the big epic punch up, Carpenter wanted a classic fight. With Roddy Piper cast, you can't not have a fight. Keith had some experience with boxing but wasn't a trained fighter. The stunt coordinator rehearsed with Piper and David for over a month and a half to create the ultimate fight that goes on for nearly six minutes. The always reliable Meg Foster plays Holly Thompson who works for Cable 54 that dominates LA. Her job is the assistant program director. She becomes aware of Nada's plans to reveal the aliens to the public and keeps close tabs on him. The late George Buckflower plays Drifter, a homeless man who gets easily persuaded by the aliens to join them and do their bidding for a taste of the wealthy lifestyle. George, I'm sure you recognise as a drunk guy from Back to the Future 1 and 2. He also popped up in John's other movies, Escape from New York, Starman and Village of the Damned. The awesome Peter Jason plays Gilbert, who is part of the rebels who have discovered the aliens have taken over. His job is to recruit more people to support the cause. Peter started working with Carpenter on Prince of Darkness and will continue to star in the rest of his movies from then on. Once the cast were in place, they set up the shoot in downtown LA and shot for eight weeks from March 1988 till April. The movie opens with John Nader drifting through LA looking for work. He notices the rise in the homeless and spots a preacher speaking out about how the rich and powerful have taken over. He talks about how everyone has been blinded to the truth and how human spirits have been corrupted by greed. John eventually manages to secure work at a construction site and befriends fellow construction worker Frank, who leads him to a local shantytown for food and a place to rest. John spots a nearby church which appears to have people coming and going. 
dropping off boxes. Helicopters circle the area and it all seems very suspicious. One of the homeless has a TV and complains of headaches due to the TV signal being interrupted by a man warning everyone about those in power. John knows something is not right and spots one of his new friends Gilbert heading to the church. When the interrupting signal disappears, he goes to investigate and finds out the church is just a front. The choir heard outside is an audio recording and the building is filled with scientific equipment and cardboard boxes. Nada finds a box hidden in the wall, but doesn't get a chance to take it. That night, the police attack and bulldoze the shantytown, as the powers that be have decided to remove them. Nada returns the following morning to find the church empty, but manages to get the hidden box and takes it down an alley in the city. He finds it filled with sunglasses. John puts on the glasses and realises they reduce the colours of the world around him to black and white and allow him to see the subliminal commands to obey, consume, reproduce and conform. They also make clear that many people in positions of wealth and power are actually humanoid aliens. Freaked out, he stumbles into a grocery store and confronts an alien woman who then speaks into her wristwatch, notifying others about him. John attempts to flee but gets caught by two police officers that quiz him on how he got the glasses. He fights back and kills them both, grabs a shotgun and runs into a bank where he starts taking out the aliens. More police are alerted to his presence so he hides in a car park and takes Holly as a hostage as she returns to her car. At her luxury hilltop home, John tries to convince her of the truth. Holly reveals she works for Cable 54, which John believes has some involvement with the aliens, but Holly quickly knocks him out through a window. John tumbles down a steep hillside and luckily escapes before the police arrive, losing his glasses in the process. He has to get another pair and find the rebels to get answers, but first he needs his new friend Frank to join him in the battle against the aliens. With They Live having a limited budget, the visual effects are kept to a minimum. It's also very conservative with its shots that sell the reality of the world and how you see the aliens via the sunglasses. The movie incorporates matte paintings, opticals and stop motion animation. For the small amount of money the production had, the visual effects have generally stood up quite well over time. The best effects shots are easily the matte paintings by Jim Danforth, who handles the special photographic effects for the film. Jim also worked with Carpenter on Prince of Darkness. The matte paintings are bordering on photorealistic. My favourite shot is when you see a wonderful wide shot of the city and you see all the hidden messages. When they shot the movie, Roddy didn't know what the aliens would look like because all of the POV stuff would be shot later by John and a second unit team. The shots of the aliens in black and white often times the footage is a bit inconsistent in quality, exhibiting flicker, which could be a result of the age of the footage and the transfer to high definition, or it's possibly a grading issue. It may have been done on purpose, of course, to provide some slight distortion when you wear the glasses or contact lenses, which results in the headaches you get if you wear them for extended periods of time. As mentioned earlier, there is some stop motion animation, which I believe is only for the close up of the drone that watches over the aliens. It's nothing special to look at. There are additional video effects and opticals, and there is a cool shot of the transport system the aliens use to jump to other galaxies. At the end, when a satellite is destroyed, you get a single matte painting with an optical explosion added. All the effects do the job in serving the story, and for the small budget they had, the FX team did a very good job. Alan Howarth teams up with John Carpenter for their final collaboration on the soundtrack. Alan and John started working together on Escape from New York. Alan provides the technology and did the mixing for John, but over time took on more composing duties. They Live takes on a bluesy sound that kickstarts the movie, then more of the traditional synthesizer sounds take over. It leans more to the atmospheric sound that Carpenter was known for, but it doesn't quite have the action cues or memorable themes of his past scores, apart from the main blues theme that pops up during the movie and the end credits. What makes it stand out is its change of direction. John provides a blues sound that he hasn't done before and nicely fits with the tone and style of the movie. Carpenter always composed the music once the movie was edited and in most cases improvised a lot of the music. Once he got the baseline for the theme, he would build all the extra music around it. During the 80s, technology was improving every six months or so. Alan would add more tech to the studio so that they could play around with new sounds and recording techniques. Howarth slowed down recording of Carpenter's voice ordering people to sleep, a subliminal audio message that's heard by Piper's character when he puts on the glasses, and other sound effects were added to the mix that actually become part of the score instead of just an isolated sound effect. 
They Live got a soundtrack release in 1988 on CD and LP by Enigma Records featuring 10 tracks totaling just over 30 minutes. It wasn't until 20 years later that Alan Howarth published a 20th anniversary expanded score featuring 29 tracks totaling over 18 minutes of music. Some of the tracks do feature sound effects which I'm never a huge fan of when it comes to soundtracks but granted many of the tracks are bonus ones which are taken directly from the movie sound mix. Getting a physical copy of the score may prove a bit challenging but it's available on iTunes for a very cheap price and it's definitely worth adding to your collection if you're a fan of John and Alan's music. Personally I don't think it's their best collaboration, I think that goes to Big Trouble in Little China which has more energy and big action cues to make an overall better score and listening experience. They Live was a film in John Carpenter's catalogue of features that I didn't see growing up and only caught it when it eventually made its way to DVD in the early 2000s. I experienced his previous movie Prince of Darkness the same way. At first I didn't know what to expect with it, but being a fan of John Carpenter I knew I was in for something interesting and fun. Thankfully They Live certainly lives up to its cult status. It's very much remembered and praised for its political commentary. It's clear on what John is saying, who are the good guys and who are the bad. It's very straightforward with its message on greed, corruption and the neglect of the poor. It's certainly not subtle about its message. It's not trying to be balanced or say impartial. That's not its goal. It's a very cynical view on the world. You can accept it for what it is or choose to ignore that message. I think if you are not fussed about its political themes, you can still enjoy it for its science fiction elements. I love movies such as Body Snatchers or The Faculty, where there are monsters or aliens hiding in plain sight that are aiming to take over. It's that sense of paranoia and who to trust, even questioning the ones close to you. That makes those stories very appealing. Casting Roddy Piper I think would have been seen as risky. You have a guy who is a wrestler and not known as an actor by trade. We all know wrestling on TV has elements of acting, but it's not the levels of cruelty you expect from a feature film. Roddy proved that he could handle the material and hold the film together being the lead. Surprisingly he does a very good job, thanks to John Carpenter who took the time to make sure he got the best performance out of him. A lot of people who don't have a strong acting experience, who are cast for their looks or say fighting skills, need a director that can help them and some directors don't have the skills to work closely with actors, thus you end up with a bad performance. That's why Arnold Schwarzenegger does a great job with James Cameron and Jean-Claude Van Damme with Peter Himes. Roddy is not given overly complicated lines of dialogue, a lot of his performance comes from his reactions to everything around him that really sells his performance. Owing to the relative success of the movie, it opened the doors for other wrestlers to take a stab at acting roles, although the majority didn't have much success. Hulk Hogan probably came the closest at the time, but Hogan really just played an extension of his wrestling persona and didn't demonstrate that he could be taken seriously as an actor. I think The Rock is the only one to have been truly successful in Hollywood and in breaking away from his wrestling roots. The epic fight in the film is superb. They try to keep it very realistic, with no martial arts involved, just a brutal punch up with some wrestling moves thrown in for good measure. You'd think a fight just consisting of punches would be pretty dull for its length, but good lord it's fantastic. It boasts excellent choreography and is brutal with its execution. It's shot in wide angles and long takes. They cut after an impact and not once they hit, which is perfect. It's definitely the most fondly remembered scene from the film for many, and who can blame them? It was also wonderfully spoofed in South Park in the episode Cripple Fight. Keith David is always fantastic in everything he does, and in They Live he gives another fine performance. His character wants to keep his head down and not get involved in Nader's conspiracy theory, he just wants to stick to the rules and avoid getting into trouble, but after some serious persuasion he fights back. All of his frustrations about his past and how he lost his job are all focused on getting revenge. It's sad that he gets killed off without much of a challenge, but he was just an extra cog in the system to help John and thankfully his efforts are not wasted. Meg Foster doesn't really get much screen time, but when she is on screen she makes a big impact. Meg has that skill of selling her performance while saying very little. She has such a cold persona when she interacts with John for the first time. We the audience know she can't be trusted and that Nada is totally naive. He is far too trusting after she knocks him out of a window. He is still kind to her and has too much faith in her since she has been corrupted from the start. It's a shame that Nada can't persuade her or for her to show signs of switching sides. The cinematographer... Right, okay, that's enough of that. Um, just a reminder, you're listening to um, Free Association on revolution.radio. Uh, you can find Revolution Radio also shows up on a lot of internet sites. 
the the kind of collect radio stations together and on tune in and all all sorts of places. Uh, would it's listener supported? There's two two studios running twenty four hours a day. So if you can make a regular donation, uh, go along to Revolution Radio and sign up as a patron, uh, and that way you'll get access to the archives. I think. Five or six dollars a month will get you access to the archives. That's what I'm doing anyway. Let me just see if it does get me access to the archives because I think they're, they're not free anymore. So I might be able to get in there now or I might not. Right, so the archives look like they're still happening the way they were last month. Yeah, they are. So uh, until they change that, you can get them for free. And uh, there's a lot of good shows on here. Um, Adventures of a Feral Hippie is Mona's show. Mo I like Mona. She's very good at what she does. Um, fact or theories shows good but Donald in the morning um, I listen to uh, once a week on a Friday usually uh, but Bruce MacDonald is astonishingly knowledgeable about a lot of things and he, he has a good delivery and he's very straightforward in the way he does things so uh, free association is mine let's see if you can get August archives, yeah, yes, you can get August archives. So, if you want to listen to last week's show, then uh, they're in the archives for my show. So, most of the shows will be up to date now. It takes a bit of time to get everything up to date, but everybody who runs Revolution Radio is a volunteer. So, if you can support, then please, uh, five dollars a month, uh, if you've got it spare, uh, we'll keep everything running. I'll get you access to the archives, five or six dollars, whatever it turns out to be. Uh, the round tables are always interesting, and there's a lot of round tables overnight. Anyway, there's loads of red pill round tables, particularly good. Perfect triangle is a good show. There's lots of different shows on there that are that are good. Everybody's got a different style of delivery and, and goes for slightly different approaches to topics. And that's why I like it. I can do my thing here, you know, with my approach and it doesn't cause any issues because everybody knows that we're all individuals, we've all got our own ways of doing stuff. So the other things that I've been I've been doing this week. Uh, I've been letting go of anger. I'm I'm doing that directly now, rather than as as resistance or or frustration or whatever. I'm just going straight to anger and letting go of it. And uh, I also um, I recorded something this week that was about uh, swimming in emotion that didn't belong to me. Uh, so I'm I'm thinking that the anger is just generic human anger. It's not necessarily mine. So the only bits that I need to let go of are things that are specifically mine. And uh, that will make life a lot easier. Uh, for that, I'm use, I've been using Sedona Method. Uh, I also was listening to uh, Byron Katie. Let me, put, let me find some Byron Katie, because the work is very good for this sort of thing as well. Uh, the work of Byron Katie. Here we go. Let me see. I'm about 15 minutes into this one. It's a Byron Katie on money. And the channel's called Always in the Now. And we're just going to play some of this because it's it's useful for me to, to keep going over uh, all of my money-related kind of thoughts. 
and Byron Katie's got a, a process to do that. So how do you live when you hold the story that, um, read the last part of that again, or read the shouldn't. Money shouldn't leave me. So how do you live when you hold the belief that money shouldn't leave you, and it does? Well, you know something really interesting. When we were going through this whole thing, um, I began to realize that almost everything here applies to, the, to my mother. And when I got this thing connected to money, connected with my mother, yeah. my mother shouldn't leave me or not care about me or go to other people. Yeah. I mean, I, I got that into that yeah. emotional space, and I didn't quite know that... Okay, so, so start at the top again, and where you have the word money, put the word mother. Mother shouldn't leave me or not care about me or go to other people. Yeah. And the next one? Mm -hmm. Number two? Number two, mm -hmm. I want my mother to be safe, secure, appreciated, free, and powerful. Mm -hmm. You're beginning to see how you only attach to beliefs. There's no such thing as money or mother or any of it. That the concept is our God. The concept. We investigate the concept, we lose the whole world that never existed in the first place. And the next one, number three. Money should my mother. my mother should make me should make me allow me to be safe, free, whole, and joyful. Mm. And my mother, my story, she left when I was three. So I probably have converted to something here. Maybe drop the probably. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You think it's connected? Mm. <laughs> no, no. They're just concepts you haven't investigated. So put your, first, put your wife's name there. You brought her up. Read the first one again. Um, Felice should make me, allow me to be safe, free, whole, and joyful. Yeah. That's my ex-wife. And the next one? And the next is Felice shouldn't leave me or not care about me or go to other people. Yeah. So you hang on to your wife uh -huh. and the story of your mother uh -huh. and money uh -huh. equally. So it's not the money, the wife, the mother that is the problem or the discomfort. It's the concept that you're attached to. You haven't investigated. I investigated. Ask the four questions uh -huh. and turn it around. I see. And that's the investigation of the concept. Mm -hmm. That's why I can't have a daughter, a husband, or money. None of it's real for me. And the world tells me I have a daughter, a husband, and money. Mm -hmm. And that's their story, and I say thank you for sharing, and it cannot ever be true for me. I'm yeah. happy instead. I mean, you don't have, you don't have the, the, the concept, but you do have the person. <laughs> I mean, but the person is there. care of people that I love. Hopeless. Yeah, we went over that before. <laughs> you keep looking at me like he's going to get one right here. <laughs> to be there when I want it. Yes, clearly. Uh, to help me build things that I like. Yes, sweetheart. And take care of the people that I love. Yes. Feel a lot better. Yeah. I think There's so. nothing welcome, Angel. But there's nothing you can do to keep us coming in in that space of truth when you're living integrity. And I see you come to it very easily, very profoundly. Did you go deep? 
Thank you. You know, the way that you want to hang on money and the way you want a mother and the way you want to live happily with a family, that longing is the longing for truth. That's all it's ever been. And this is a direct route into yourself. And, and truth, you see? Is whatever you see it to be. Is a longing for truth. Yes, freedom. Truth, freedom, God, all synonymous. Uh -huh. Same word, light. Right. That's right. All of that is a longing for truth. Yes. Yeah. Truth. The well, truth is sort of like what you say, what is? Yes. Yeah. And that's that. Yeah. <laughs> You know, I love how businessmen and women, they get this thing. You know, they, this business. This is business. What is, is. A businessman can understand that. Yeah. What is, is. It's simple. It's over. Cut and dry. This is the way it is. It works or it doesn't. Put it to bed. Yeah. Yeah. And we all do business. Guidance. I need my money to be there when I want it. I need me. I need me. I, I need my my thinking. Uh, I need to, no, just I need, I need me. me. I need me to be there when I want it. When I, I want me to be. When I when I want me to be to help me build things that I like and to take care of people that I love. Take care of myself. Take care of me. Yeah. yeah. Take care of me. Yes, you haven't been taking care of you. You've been taking care of your money. <laughs> like I'll take care of me after I have enough money. That's after I get this secured. Absolutely, gotta have enough money, yeah. then I can do that. Yeah. yeah, I'll be happy then, and then never come. Yeah, yeah. Except that the ladder keeps ratcheting up. Yeah, yeah, yeah it does. It does. Mm. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah, let's look at it. Number, this is number five. Good. Money is safety, freedom, useful, useful uh, for, powerful, open, connected, strong, exciting, full of choices and adventure. That's what money is. Yeah. <laughs> Turn it around. Money is not. So money, money is exciting and adventurous. Is that true? Absolutely. Give me some. Sweetheart. <laughs> It just, it just, it just sits there. It's even boring, you know, little faces. I mean, money is, yeah. it does nothing. It just sits there. It doesn't think, it doesn't feel, it doesn't know, it doesn't care, it doesn't show favorites. It just is a piece of paper. Yeah. Even gold bullion is just that. The story you put on it is what thrills you, what scares you or excites you. Yeah, right. So, um... Um, it's just not true. So let's turn it around. I am. I am safety, freedom, useful, powerful, open, connected, strong, exciting, full of choices, and adventure. Yeah. Doesn't that feel a little more true? <laughs> well, when you think about it, you know, describe money being as neutral as it is. I was going to say, well, just give it to me. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> it would be plenty exciting. Yeah, yeah. No, it would not be exciting. I, I would, but you tell the I would, story of what it's doing and excite you. Yeah. You would tell the story of what it's going to do, and you would excite you. Yes. You tell the story of how it should come and go, and heaven or hell you. That yeah. it just lies there. Right. You tell the story of where it is and where it should stay, and you're it. It's... It's, it's, it just is. And I tell you, you're like money. You know, you're, you just are what is also. Without a story, you're just like money. It's just not personal. I'm just like money? Just like a face? Not, not even that. Who would you be without that story? Really? <laughs> well, that's a little frightening. <laughs> You think about it. I'm That's what that. frightened you. You thought about it. <laughs> Welcome to the re-entry.
Well, who would I be without Astoria? <laughs> I'm making this all up as to what's happening, right? Oh, oh, sweetheart. Yeah. Just be still a moment. Who would you be without the story? Well, you know, I tell you, it makes me sad. I, I feel a little sad about it because I'm not sure. Yeah, it's the, um, the loss of a dream. The dream of I. I need money. I'm a man. I have a faith. I, 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 I. Who would you be without the story? Oh, I would have, I, I, I see what you're saying. You know, sweetheart, you're one that could sit with this and... Okay, Byron Katie, uh, doing some uh, work around projections onto money there. Uh, it, it's good, good material. And the, the process is very simple. There's, a, there's an app, there's an Android app, and I think an iPhone app as well that will take you through the process. If you just look at Byron Katie on Google Play or somewhere, or the iPhone app store or whatever it's called, then you'll find the app and it'll take you through the four questions and a turnaround. So the questions, this is from memory, so I might not get it right. Is it true? Can you really know it that it's true? Um, who would you be without that thought? Oh, I can't remember the last one anyway. And, but the turnarounds are always reversing the, the projection. So bring it back to to me uh, or reversing the the noun or the verb that's in the in the sentence that you're writing down it's worth looking up the work of byron katie let's do that now let's, let's just look it up and i'm going to read read the official version so the work i think it is somewhere on here so it's all about letting go of stressful thoughts and it's very direct so here we go I'll just go through the practice so uh, who or what upsets angers or saddens you why recall a specific situation it's always a specific situation uh, with the work uh, capture your stressful thoughts on a worksheet using short, simple sentences. Isolate and question one thought. Allow authentic answers to arise and then turn it around. Find opposites of the thought. Are they as true or truer than the original thought? So there are free worksheets on the website. It's a little bit of a personality cult, but don't let that put you off uh, because there's some good things there and they're worth taking a look at. So it's called the Judge Your Neighbour Worksheet. Because it's all about, yeah, here we go. There's the four questions. Is it true? Can you absolutely know that it's true? How do you react? What happens when you believe that thought? And the last question that I couldn't remember was, who would you be without that thought? So you're doing that with one, one statement about a person or a relationship or a situation. And the turnarounds are interesting. Usually she asks for three, three examples of turnarounds. And there are question cards there. Uh, there's two or three different lists of, emo there's a list of emotion, a list of universal beliefs. 
Judge Geneva worksheet, uh, four question cards, uh, one belief at a time worksheet. I downloaded a couple of these. So the Judge Geneva worksheet I found useful. The emotions list is useful and the list of universal beliefs I found useful as well. And uh, yeah, that's that's more or less it with the work. It's really about practice. So it's a it's a meditation process of just going inside and remembering the the situation or remembering the person and then feeling feeling the res resentment or the anger or whatever it is that comes up for you. And it's about stressful thoughts, so it's not going to be joy that comes up. But uh, it's better to let go of it. It's better just recognize it, accept it, and then work through it. And uh, usually, I find that uh, I can I can turn things around. Uh, I sometimes go back to the same person again a few times, or the same situation again a few times. But eventually, you can shift your attachment to whatever emotion is is stuck and being associated with the situation so this is all about letting go of projection really and uh, we're, we're all projecting pretty much all of the time uh, it's, it's what makes human re relationships so so drama filled so I wouldn't necessarily remove all of it but uh, you don't want to be reacting to stuff now that happened 35 or 40 years ago uh, or 20 years ago or even five months ago you it's much better to be in the in the moment here and now and enjoying enjoying life as it is rather than projecting an old story onto it so the theme today has been narratives um philosophical narratives personal stories um I didn't realize that when I was putting the show together, but that's how it's turned out. So uh, I'm, I'm happy with that as a theme. I might come back to that as a theme at a later date because uh, it's, it's a good way of hooking various different movies and various different um, assumptions, collections of assumptions, really. A narrative is a collection of assumptions that you, that you live, live through. Uh, so this is part of the part of the imagination creates reality kind of theme as well. Uh, once again, uh, you're listening to Revolution Radio. My name's Dennis. The show's called Free Association. Uh, you can find the the website online is freeassociationradioshow.com, and there are a couple of other places you can find me. Imagination creates reality. Live. Is one of my places. Um, CanSecureMastermindGroup.com is another one. Uh, you can find me at ReikiMasterInitiation.com as well. Those are the websites that I'm actively developing. My background's in in Reiki, uh, but obviously the all of these things are healing or ways of ways of living here and now. That, uh, that don't pull your past stories with you. Let go of the story is kind of the key point that I'm trying to get to. That's what I'm trying to do with my life is let go of the story and just live, live here and now in a sensible way. Um, I, I'm probably not going to retire for another 10 years, but I've got to... I've got a little bit of pension tucked away, so it's not all about here and now. You've got to you've got to prepare, but uh, don't ignore the opportunities. Don't ignore the the fun that you can have by being in the moment. So let's have a look at the chat room. See how who's in the chat room. So we've got we've got Comet in there. We've got Doc Time. We've got Meow. Mr. Rose in the chat room as well. Uh, Lady Horse, Captain Fred, Mer Bailey, Blasphemous Burra. Oh, the Discord. Uh, the Discord is, ooh, let me remember, it's, it's Free Association Radio Show Live, I think is the name of the Discord, off the top of my head. 
Um, there's quite a lot in there as well. I've been I pulled. I've been posting. I post videos there. I do all my research there, and I've I've been doing kind of uh, short shows, research shows, really during the week. Uh, I might potentially do a show there on Sundays as well. I haven't made my mind yet, mind up yet. Um, I'll post it in the chat room just for people who who want it. Uh, and let me just let people know that I'm Dennis. Uh, so yeah, if you do have if you do have Discord, uh, I'm going to replay this show probably tomorrow sometime, and I, I do my research more or less live on Discord. So if you want to join me there, you you might get some input into the show that way, or you can. Come to revolution.radio and, and connect in the chat room. There's lots of different ways to find me. Uh, all of them are good. And I'll see you again next next Saturday. Uh, 11 a.m. on the East Coast in the States, 4 o'clock in the UK. Uh, see you then.